Uh, we're going to do a little presentation. Uh, if you can imagine yourself being back on board the ship right, during Pearl Harbor. And we're going to start with that. I'm not going to tell you who and what I am. I'll tell you who I really am. My name is Tom Dandies and uh, I'm, I'm in charge of CPO Heritage. I've ran it now for 18 years. Um, I'm the senior judge. So you'll see me out there during your cadence competition. So I'll put it out right now. I can be bribed. Challenge coins, money orders, help. You buy me lunch, I'm good, okay? So um, I have 22 years in the Navy. I was a senior chief boiler technician and uh, retired in 98, all right? Back here in the back, we have one of your own. Go ahead and say hi, Rosie. Hello. Hi, Rosie. Hi, Good morning. Good morning. Oh, let's try that one again. Good morning. Good morning. Wake you up. All right. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Chief Petty Officer Peter Tom Each. Well, I've been asked by the XO to come down here and talk to you a little bit this morning. I know we got a lot of new people on board, but he wants me to make sure that you folks know exactly what's going on over the next few days. He also would like for me to relay to you a little bit about what's, what our ship is and our status. But before we do that, let me tell you something about myself. I was uh, born in Austria-Hungary, and I came to the United States with my brother John, where we lived in New Jersey. Jobs were hard to find, and because of that, I joined the United States Army. I served in the United States Army through World War I as a medic until the end of the war. It was at that time I was granted my U.S. citizenship and 10 days later I joined the United States Navy. I'm a chief water tender. And my duties and responsibilities on board this ship are all the auxiliary spaces, the engine rooms, fire rooms, everything in engineering because I am the senior engineer. The chiefs on board this ship will tell you, and they made it jokingly, that the ship is my wife. Well, that is partially true. Uh, I've never married, and I live on board. But I will tell you this. The people that work for me are my family. We are tight family. And because of that, we take care of our own. And that's something you're going to learn on board to Utah. We are a tight-knit family, and we do take care of our own. Is that understood? Yes, sir. Roger that. All right, let's talk a little bit about our ship. We're not the oldest ship in the Navy, but we're darn close to it. Ship was built in 1909. We have four boilers, two main engines, and our top speed through the water is 21 knots. We have reciprocating engines. We used to be a battleship, but we're not. I mean, we're a training ship now. Some of you have probably already been up topside and noticed that all the turrets, the gun houses, there's no guns in them. They've all been removed. The 12 inch guns are gone. Five inch. Even our anti-aircraft batteries, the 1.1s, are all been removed. In place of that, we have these huge oak timbers. 
They're scattered across the deck, sandbags everywhere. Like I said, we are a training ship, and we're being used for bombing practice by the Navy pilots. They actually drop practice bombs on us. That's why we have these sandbags and timbers. Now today, a lot of you are going to be involved with getting all these sandbags and timbers off this ship. We have a barge alongside, and all that stuff has to go to the barge. As soon as it does, we'll start making preps to go over to the shipyard. The USS Pennsylvania is in dry dock right now. We are going to take her place Monday morning if everything goes right. All right? You have to have some whole work done. I can see by the clock I need to get back on watch. I do have watch in the fire room right now. If you have any questions and you see me up top side or walking through the P ways, please say something. I'll be happy to talk to you. Until then, welcome to the Utah. They just passed first call to colors when we've had a tremendous explosion on board. The ship has been lifted out of the water, rocked, and then slammed. I'm getting reports from all spaces that we have men down, hurt. It's utter confusion right now in the engine rooms and fire rooms. Nobody knows what is going on. I order my messenger to leave the fire room and go over to the port fire room to find out what is the cause of this explosion. He calls back over and he tells me that the aft bulkhead in that space is shattered like an eggshell. We have water pouring in from the port engine room through the wireways and all the lagging areas. The water is already up to the bilge levels, the deck plates, and still rising. I were able to light off the emergency pumps and stand by. I start screaming to the port side engine room to find out just exactly what has happened. I get no answers. Nothing. Starboard side engine room calls back over to tell me that the hatch going between port and starboard engine room is wedged shut. That they can hear our people over there on the other side screaming and yelling, beating on the hatches to try to get them out of the space. The space is filling full of steam and water and there's nothing we can do for them. The officer of the deck calls down from the bridge and reports that we are being attacked by the Japanese. That the hit on the port side was from a Japanese torpedo. And the ship is starting to list. At 0801, Utah has a port side list of 14 degrees and increasing. The officer of the deck also tells me that the hit on the port side was only from the Japanese but over on Ford Island, the, the ships along Ford Island on Battleship Row are being attacked. He starts to talk to me and in disbelief, and his voice starts breaking up as he tries to describe to me that the USS Arizona has just exploded into a huge fireball. Parts of the Arizona are raining down on Ford Island, that the ship is gone. Portside fire room messenger calls back now and says the flooding there can't be stopped. Already him out of the space. Dog the hatch. At 0758, second torpedo hit. List is getting even further now. I call back over to the starboard side engine room. They call back and report that the flooding there is uncontrollable. The water level is already up to their knees. 
There's no stopping the flooding now in engineering. I call the bridge and inform them that we are going to lose this ship. We are going to lose the Utah. At 0801, Utah has a list of 14 degrees and increasing. I order my bin out of the spaces. Start making their way up topside to evacuate the ship. The problem is the list. I'm having to walk the handrails back and forth between the spaces to make sure all of my people are out. The ladders going topside are at impossible angles. We have our wounded that we're trying to drag up topside to the main deck. It seems like an eternity we finally get our people out of engineering and onto the main deck, right, where they'll be safe. At 0805, Utah's list is at 40, 40 degrees. Huh? The huge timbers that were stacked with the deck are falling on the sailors trying to swim to shore. The Japanese are scraping the survivors that are in the water trying to escape. As my people are starting to leave the ship to go to Fort Island to make the swim over, I realize that number two boiler is still firing. If the incoming water hits that boiler, the thermal shock will cause it to explode. And when it does, it will cut this ship in half, killing everybody topside and in the water. I have to go back down. I have to get back down to the fire room. So I turn to leave. My people are screaming at me because they know where I'm going. They're trying to get me to go with them. I can't. It's my fire room. It's my responsibility. I get back down to the lower level of the fire room and I pull the fuel trips, steering fuel to the boiler. Fires go out. Steam drum pressure starts to slowly drop, and as it drops, I lift safeties on the boiler, relieving the pressure. And I can hear the steam escaping out of the stack. As it goes out of the stack, steam drum pressure falls, the generator starts slowing down. And as they slow, the lights start to dim, and then they go out. I'm five decks down inside this ship, lower level. There's no way for me to get out. It's all quiet now, and I can hear the mooring lines that are holding us to the pier to keep us upright pop. They sound like whips as the ship continues to list. All I can do at this point is hang on to the lifelines and pray. During the attack, even while the ship was being strafed, you could hear on the sides of the Utah. We had triple people trapped inside, trapped inside the armor belt. While the ship was being strafed, a repair party was formed from my family that was over on the beach of Ford Island to come back on board the ship. And they cut a hole through the aft portion of the ship into where they heard the first set of tapping. They removed one person. Despite all rescue attempts, nobody else was taken out of the ship. 58 people died inside that ship today and they still remain inside. They were never recovered. They still remain at Ford Island on board the Utah. Also at Ford Island inside the USS Utah is a baby girl. Her name is Nancy Lynn Walker. She was still born and her cremated remains were brought on board, on board by storekeeper chief Walker and was placed in his locker. The ship was supposed to go out with the chaplain 
and they were going to give her a family burial at sea, as was tradition. They were a Navy family. The chaplain didn't make it. He put her back in his locker, and she still remains inside the chief's mess to this day. On more than one occasion, her twin sister has gone back to visit her right, to the ship, right, to lay a wreath. But she is still there. While things were still trying to be sorted out in Pearl Harbor, a letter was sent to John Tom Each, Peter's brother, to let him know right, that his brother had died at Pearl Harbor, killed in action. The letter was returned back to the War Department, address unknown. Not long after, another letter was sent from the President of the United States to inform John that his brother had been awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions on board the ship that day right, in saving his people and making sure they got off the ship. It was returned, address unknown. Nobody knew where John was. He had gone back to the old country. Couldn't get a job. During the uh, war, a destroyer was built. It was named and christened Tom Each. Right. The metal was transferred to that ship on that destroyer and it stayed on the mess decks for many years until the end of the war when the ship was decommissioned. When it was decommissioned, it was taken back by the Navy. The governor of Utah decided that he wanted the bell and the metal to be brought to Utah where it could be put on display with all honors at the State House. And it was transferred by the Navy there. And it stayed there for many years. Until something happened in Newport, Rhode Island. A new schoolhouse was built. Does anybody know what that schoolhouse is? Senior Enlisted Academy. There you go. Tom E. Hall. Right? The medal was transferred from Utah back. Right? Where it stayed at the quarter deck for many, many years. But it bothered a lot of people that the medal had never been given to the awardee or to a family member. And it didn't sit well with a lot of people in the Navy. Admiral Looney, a three-star, took it upon himself to go back over to the old country with his own money and researched and researched until he finally found a surviving member of the family. The USS Enterprise steamed into Croatia and with full military honors presented that medal to General Tom Each right on board and the medal finally found a home but it took until 2003 for that to happen. Right? That's a long time. One of the reasons why it took so long Tom Each didn't speak very well as far as his English. When he enlisted in the Navy, they couldn't understand his last name. It was supposed to be T-O-M-I-C-K. Tomik. With his accent, they couldn't figure it out. <laughs> so they put it down as Tom Each. Right? And the Navy had some problems with that later on because when they tried to award the medal, right, the last names didn't match up. But it finally was straightened out. Any questions, folks? Anything, anything? Okay, before we send you out of here, uh, real quick, a little bit about your chief history. This is a chief petty officer uniform from World War II. Uh, this is the working uniform. They wore the same dungarees as the E6 and below. What's different, right? Of course, there's no anchors. The only difference is the cap and the fact you got a brass buckle. That's how you knew it was a chief. Right? Now, does anybody notice anything different about that cap? The anchor's different, isn't it? Anything else about the cap? It's behind the anchor. There's no black badge behind it. It does not bolt to the badge. It bolts, I should say, pins, literally pins, directly to the hat cover. 
Okay. The uniform, like I say, is is correct. Uh, there's no flaps over the pockets. The bells on these things, if I can get my feet up high enough, you can see, are huge. That's so you can slip your legs in and out with your shoes on in case you need it. Remember, this is a flotation device. All right, you tie knots in the legs, flip them over, and you can stay afloat with them. Now, real quick, tell you a little story about the Utah that happened that day. The people that came over to form the rescue were from the Utah. They didn't have anything with them, so they had to run down the side of Ford Island to the next ship. And when they did, they went to the first ship, ran up on the quarter deck, and screamed and yelled at them, please help us, help us, right? We've got to get this uh, a cutting torch so we can cut a hole through the side of the ship to rescue our people. The officer of the deck of that ship said no. It's controlled material. Refused to give it to them. So they had to run further down Ford Island to the next ship where they were actually given the torch so they can come back in and rescue this guy. The guy that was in there, right, was on the ass switchboard. He knew the ship was rolling. And even though he knew the ship was rolling, he stayed there throwing fuses into this switchboard constantly, knowing full well that if the lights ever went out inside this ship, that was the end of it. Nobody was going to get out. There's no emergency lighting in that ship. So he stayed there, even though she's going over. Right, when he went over, he grabbed two things that were near him. Right, after the ship rolled, one of the things he grabbed was a flashlight. He went to the top, which is now the, the bottom and so on and so forth. Top is bottom, bottom is top. But he went up into the bills level, and there he found a tank top cover. The other thing that he had grabbed happened to be the only wrench that was in that space. And guess what? It fit the tank top cover bolts. Right? Now, we all know that tanks on board ships are full of fuel, water, CHT. I mean, you don't know what's in them, right? But they're always something. Right? He turned around and opened up that tank top cover, and guess what? There was nothing inside. He was able to crawl through, started beating on the hole. They found him. They cut the hole. They were able to get him out. Tell me that wasn't meant to be. Right? He ended up getting the silver star for his actions that day.